Didn't talk to many people, didn't have too much to say. There was something, something about him coming in on the smuggler's boat. But he walked around the town with a shotgun in his coat. Shotgun in his coat. Hey, everybody. Today is March 17th. Happy St. Patty's Day. Faith and Begora. It's a good day to eat some cabbage, eat some taters. Whether you boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Today is also a good day of the wearing of the green. Today is a day where we celebrate the liberation of slaves of all kinds, particularly slaves to sin. Sin darkens the intellect. If you want to get better at role-playing games and war games, go see a priest. Go to confession. It'll help. It'll clear your head in ways you can't. Imagine, Jeremy Herndon does not remember the song that way. I'm pretty sure that's how it always went. Uh, I could probably, eventually, maybe we could do a whole thing. It kind of falls apart when it starts talking about, uh, well, it wouldn't be Texas Red, would it? Would it be Corvinus Red? So Chad Solo is our hero. We're going to take a look at him here today. Uh, would we call him Blobster Red? Oh, look at that, man. That song is tailor-made, right? I'm looking for Blobster Red, he said. Let's talk a little bit about the fallout from last session. Afternoon, Sar Bombadil. It is only 5 o'clock on the east coast of these United States. Holy shnikes. That means we got, the, we got the mainlanders checking in. He's going early. How about that? We got all day to kill, barring some unforeseen emergency. So let's, let's kill it, man. Let's have, some, let's have some fun. As you recall... So I got, I got to tell you, keeping track of all this stuff. Hey, Paul Stanley. Uh, he's coming from Canada. Good day, mate. Oh, wait, that's a whole different part of the uh, Commonwealth, isn't it? Uh, I, I hope you've, you've curled up with some... some of the, what's, oh, man, now I'm drawing a blank. What's the coffee you guys like so much? Tim Hortons? Hope you got a piping hot cup of Tim Hortons and you're ready to go. As I said, today is the 17th. Uh, Chad uh, fumbles his interview with Captain Munderdeuce. And I, if you will permit me, I we've been having some fun. I, I don't know that I want to make this a regular thing, but it seems to be working out okay. Let's take a look at old Munderdeuce. This could have been us. This, this, this is my blog. For those of you that haven't seen yet, these are the books that I wrote. Uh, get, get out of the way, you. There we go. So I wrote a book called Neon Harvest. This is a really good book. Barbarian Emperor is pretty good. Overlooked. That's the first of a trilogy. I still need to get the third one out. I feel bad for that. Uh, yeah, Neon Harvest. Really good, man. Really good. Anyway, this is what I wanted to show you. This this is this is Captain Munder. Somebody uh, who was this? Uh, Saint Dude Del Sabiades. He he made this little picture of of Munderduce, which I thought was too great not to share with you. So there it is. And then and then I was like, you know, this could have been us, but you always playing. So I made one of of Munderduce. Right, he, Munderduce could have had the ladies. With old Chad Solo, but it just wasn't meant to be. Chad was out drinking, and he fell in with a rough crowd. He tried to get away in time, but it just just wasn't happening. I also realized that this is our cult leader. Not cult leader. He's our religious leader. Here on the, the planet of Corvinus, I think maybe maybe the, the, the religious group, because they're truly neutral, maybe they handle law enforcement on the streets. Anyway, this is Hank Hillsong. I just, you, know, you can't just go with the straight... You gotta punch it up a little bit. So old Hank Hillsong is the head of the Church of Dagon. Well, that heretic ain't right. So now, for those of you that don't know, and see, he's even got the the, the Dagon hat with with the Dagon uh, trucker cap on it. So whenever we run into religious guys, uh, they'll be pretty neutral with us. But I had to go back and rewatch the episode, the the last episode, because I couldn't remember. We were firing stuff off the cuff, and. I, I, I'm glad I listened to it, because usually when I'm filming these things, I'm thinking about you guys. I'm thinking about keeping you entertained, and I, I don't take as good a, uh, I don't take as good a notes as I probably should. Jeremy says, no mustache for, for Hank Hillsong. Is that a thing for a Hillsong? I can always add one. That's doable. What is, oh, yeah, um, hey, Luke Farrell, boy, you guys are still up, huh? What, it's, what, what is it, GMT... Plus five. Oh, so it's probably about 10, 11 o'clock. Man, this is a good time. I should record it this time all the time. The 
Here, here's the notes on 315. Oh, Chegg's Venture was the 400. Wait, maybe take on Chegg. Oh, you know, we already named it Chegg's Venture with Captain Jeremy Herndon. I feel bad, Jeremy. I got to rename something else after you because I'm, I'm loving this Captain Munderdeuce. As we said, he was the fastest guy ever promoted from second in command to command because nobody in the Merchant Marines wanted to have to talk to the uh, number two named Deuce. Uh, the Money Pit. So Chegg's Venture, man, I wish I would have realized that. I, here's the thing. In addition to the live stream, I try to update the blog, and I try to update this little notebook for use during actual play. So I just have a couple of notes. And all I wrote down is, Chad meets fans of Wayland Tsunami Water Polo Team, the Limpets. I'm going to call the team the Limpets. There were a lot of good suggestions in the comments. We'll have some Kelpies. Maybe we'll have some Skillas. Maybe some Charybdises. Uh, but the Limpets are the Wayland Tsunami Team. And that allows me to... The, the the team song, by the way, is I Wish I Was a Fish. The, the old guys know what I'm talking about. And gets in a brawl... You can Google it. You guys that were born, like, after 1980. Uh, he gets in a brawl with members of the Church of Dagon. Uh, he flees because he's not interested. So the Church of Dagon doesn't matter. But one of the things we have to remember is that he now abandoned his new friends, the, the Limpet fans... So if he runs into Wayland Tsunami guys, he's going to have a negative modifier for the rest of the campaign. Word is going to get around in the Wayland Tsunami circles that Chad is not to be trusted. And in this way, the events that we go through perpetuate through the campaign. So bear that in mind as we move forward. As I said, old Munderdeuce was disgusted. Well, no, it's tomorrow morning is the day that that happens, right? On April... Wait a minute. Yeah, that's, that's tomorrow. Today's the 17th. So tomorrow is when Chad fumbles that interview. And then on the 19th, we got to figure out what's going to happen to Chad. Today is only Sunday. We can kind of push out. We need to make a second check for looking for box scars for the Black Raven. Ah, not to be. So nothing happens. So no random event for the Black Raven. If we roll boxcars, then we make a check on the Starship random event table and find out who has found them, which is not a guarantee. Like, we've got a one in, I think it's 36 chance of rolling boxcars, and then when you have to check for random events on the, hi, I just dropped into the system. Are any pirates waiting for me table? I think you need to get, is it a seven or higher? You have no encounter on an eight or less. So you still have like a better than 50-50 that nothing happens. And because they're way out in the middle of the boonies, we're, oh, you know what? We're actually going to be on, let's see, X is minus four. So you're not going to have an encounter if there's not a, a thing. So we may go with like a negative two modifier on this so that you, you even have less of a chance. You, you're only going to encounter free traders. There's no pirates out there. Maybe. I got to think about that. Maybe we should do a different table for the, the encounters. Pirates might be out there. They might I'm trying to get away from the law. But you're not going to see a subsidized merchant. You're not going to see a patrol ship. Just as a reminder, they're out here in this hex. Which, I don't know, if there's a misjump, may maybe somebody could appear there. Be that as it may, our scout, Jeremy Herndon, is booked up because nothing ever happens to him. Stonk! Stonchick, rather. Hey, Luke, 9 p.m., so it's, uh, it's East Coast plus 4... Roger that. Yeah, it's usually... Yeah, okay. Uh, I got you. So the question becomes, what are we going to do today? Do we push out the, the events for Chad Solo? And I think that's worth doing. You know, if we have an event and he is able to redeem himself, maybe he can still get onto the money pit. That's the, the book, the ship that Munderdeuce is captaining. Yeah, Jeremy Powell is the scout. Isn't that great? We, we, we're leaning heavy into the, uh, you know, whatever we can find. We take inspiration from all over the place. I mean, for crying out loud, I'm, I'm using Don Knotts songs for inspiration. If I need to Photoshop the hooligans for the, the Kelpies, or the, uh, the Limpets, and that's, you know, that's one of the other things we could do here real quick. The great part about solo wargaming, is, or solo role-playing games, is you can kind of do what you want, when you want. So if you run out of time and you're waiting on the one-to-one, -one, one of the things I love about one-to-one -one time is it allows the campaign to breathe. It gives you time to think about this stuff. So I should probably write this down. I'm going to write down that these guys are the limpets, and I was thinking, and, and this is the, the team, 
the the seaweed farms is going to have the kelpies right because they're they're kelp farmers and you, would it be the red blobster lobsters but I'd like to have like some sci-fi stuff in here, right? Like, like SeaTac Astronomics. You guys said, "Oh, that's going to be the Astronomic Astros." Okay, I got it. That that makes sense. But some of these, like like w one of these, I was thinking there there's a college football team that is called the Crimson Tide, and their mascot is an elephant. Because I know when I think of tides, elephants are the first animal to come to mind. Um, it's Alabama, by the way. But Crimson Tide is really evocative. Uh, you, uh, mascot? I, I don't know that you really call a mascot. I like that. But do you think these guys really worry about the tide? These guys are in underwater domes. I know sailors think about the tide all the time. But I don't think these guys would. They probably think about something like the current. And I was trying to think of the the soccer teams have names like Galaxy or um, United, right? And like, do you, you think one of these guys has a name that's just kind of evocative of that sort of thing? The Warriors having to go through other areas? The U.S. Navy's mascot is a goat, yeah? Piranha Swarms? Um, warriors? I was trying to think, what would be, like, a, a job? W would you do the Riggers? Red Tide? Yeah? Um, what, what would... The Submariners? Would that be one? Pearl Consolidated Submariners? You know, or, or the Knife Men? Because... They, they mega pearl mine. So that's something else to think about. We don't have to commit to any of these right now. I mean, Black Reef could be the grifters, right? Um, so we don't have to do that. We don't have to, like, full, leave that. It's, it's probably a good idea to leave some of those blank because you come up with an idea where you're like, oh, I should have thought of that. One of them might be the Kraken, right? Limpets, Kelpies, Lobsters. But I wouldn't make them all animals. When you look at, when you look at mascot teams in any given league... Sometimes they're people that are heroic. Maybe the explorers would be a good one. The deep divers. Frogmen is good. I like that. Who would the frogmen be? Not Baby Sweets Consulting. They'd probably be the blue hairs. And then, like, hydronics might be a good one. Who? Who? Yeah, how about Black Reef? How about we do the Poseidons is good? How about the Black Reef frogmen? I like that. That's good. And then we'll close the book on that. Because if we think of something, one of these is probably the Kraken. We'll do we'll do Baby Sweets Consulting because they have their they have their tentacles in a whole lot of of pies on this planet. I'm sure. Um, or, or it could even be like the Kraken herders. That that might be a good one. Assume that they herd the Kraken. But to find out what happens next to Chad, we have to. I'm going to turn to the calendar so we can kind of write this down. And let me grab one other piece of paper. I always forget to grab a blank piece of paper. And then we're going to turn our attention to something else. So. Uh, here we are on the 19th is when he's available, and we'll push out a few days, and then later this week we can have some more fun with some other things. Uh, one other little bit of logistics that we can deal with is I went ahead and downloaded a couple of the, um, what do you call it, the data sheets, the forms for Jeremy Powell, and you will recall that he has a couple of helpers, uh, Muldoon and Luke. And he, I realized that we could probably streamline things a little bit. Yo, check this out. I've got, wait, where is it? Where's the little stinker? Here it is. Got it. Ship papers, commercial. Little stinkers. This is good. This is part of the form pack. I pulled this off of archive.com and printed up a couple of copies. So the little stinker is the name of the scout. I would just say it was built by Black Reef. I know we're on an opposite side of the, 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 the subsector here. But Black Reef is the heavy manufacturing. So even though the scout is running around here, maybe the, the ships were built down here anyway. Uh, a lot of the ships over here are going to be built by guys like Hydronics and Black Reef. Uh, and then, so the home world, I don't, that's not really his home world. Maybe it's the ships. Now, one of the funny things about this ship's papers, there's nowhere on here to record fuel. And I'm just like, dude, that is such a rookie mistake. You fuel is constantly going up and down, up and down. That seems like one of the most important things, and it's not on here. So I actually crossed out, laid down. Like, who cares when it took, first took flight? Who cares the, the cost and the occupation? I mean, it's a scout ship, right? So what's the, what's the occupation of our Type S scout ship? Oh, it's scouting. Now, I did record that it's owned by the National Galactographic Society. It's not owned by Jeremy. He's just, you know, it, it's his, it's the company car. Is he really a captain? I, I don't know. He's the captain when he's he's on the ship, right? And it does have an air raft. And then here's all the, everything you need. Acceleration 2, 
G's. Maintenance requirements. Well, there's a second page. We'll get to that in just a second. Four staterooms, no low berths. There are three guys on the ship. And, in fact, that's what goes over here. Oh, well, I should probably put this down. Uh, I'm going to put down, um, oh, what was the guy's name? Uh, Muldoon. I'll just write down Muldoon and Luke Farrell here. They're the, quote, crew, right? Like, they can man whatever. But uh, also, it doesn't have... And then, it, you know, list the names, UPP, skills, salaries, and shares. Wow, that's a lot of information for a little scout ship. But to be fair, this is a universal sheet that's supposed to apply for every ship everywhere. So it also has the computer model, your CPU. You got, you know, two in the dock and four in the four in the locks. Mass of, of that's how much you want. And then here's your value, 32.49 mega credits. And that means your annual maintenance is going to be, move the thing over, it's going to be 0.325 Mega credits, and I even put a date down here. We're just gonna on the March first of two thousand twenty-five. I'm assuming that they gave it to him, and it was relatively fresh. It would just come out of the the dry docks, out of um, and and to be put back into service when they were looking for a guy. So we're gonna have to take two weeks off for refurbishment. But again, it's not owned by Jeremy. He's not worried about tracking money. That's not the purpose of the little stinker. It does have a double turret with no weapons. The ship's locker can hold three tons. And we'll put all of our inventory down right here. So this is the way that the ship's... Yeah, okay, ship's locker, right? Inventory contents. Yeah, we got three open tons. We offloaded all the ammo in two weeks. Kind of interesting. So that so we've got all that recorded now. I don't need to fumble through the books. I don't need to worry about my book control anymore and uh that will kind of streamline things when we're zipping around with our scout one thing i should probably put down here is that the it's got 40 fuel on it's 40 total and i believe each jump costs like 30 fuel i'll have to double check that and write that down that would be worth knowing there may come a time where we need to know whether or not we have enough fuel to to get from point a to point b and then uh, there is uh, there, there is another sheet. I pulled this. This is what the cargo manifest looks like. So when you get into the complicated situation where you're hauling more than just, you know, you, what is it, like 5,000 a ton, and you're just hauling from point A to point B, well, well, hey, I need to know where did I get, where's it going, right? What was the price? Particularly if you're going to start playing the stock market. Uh, and you're rolling on the, the available goods and you want to sell them, then you can write down... Here's where I purchased it. Here's the price I paid. You know, what kind of world was it? And that way you can know, like, when you've got five or six different items and you think, you know, I'm not going to sell it. I might as well just wait for the next port of call. I might be able to get a better price for it. You, you'll be able to determine whether you made money on that or lost money, and if so, how much. Uh, again, this is for the ship with the tonnage and the home world, and that would just kind of simplify things a little bit. If we get back into the freight hauling game, which we might, because I like Munderdu so much that even though you know he's walking out of the Chad Solo story, he's got a story of his own that we may be able to explore. If you guys are amenable to opening up a third individual, like a third plot line to follow, although if if the experience of the Black Raven is anything to go by, then uh, <laughs> we won't be following it for very long. All right, so Chad uh, has lost a job on the 18th. He had his random encounter, his random encounter with Captain Munderdeuce, who said, "Solo, have you been drinking? Ah, I'm out of here." So what happens on the 19th? He's he's alone. He's looking for prospects, and he's going to spend this week looking for a new patron. And so on the 19th, on a five or a six, we get a five. We get another random encounter, and I told you he was going to hit. He was going to go like six for six on these. Didn't I tell you that? Because the scout burned all of our no encounters. So I knew that we were way overdue for people encounters. Fortunately, he's a lucky guy. Now, if we encounter, as I said, I think what I'm going to start doing while I'm on Corvinus, when I generate a random encounter, if it's at all appropriate, I'm going to figure out what house they're from. So we got to roll a black die and a white die. The black die is the tens place. And I get a 66, which means, is the Captain Munderduce the captain of the Nostromo? No, he's captain of the Money Pit, is what it's called. 
All right, so 66 means something very special happens. And I think that means on Tuesday that Joan Alice comes around and says, Hey, stupid. Although, I, should, should we roll on the patron? Should we assume that the 66 is a patron? We did not decide, Jeremy Herndon, what the tonnage of the Money Crater was. Is it Money Crater or is it Money Pit? Money Crater's better. I like that. Hang on, let me, let me, let me change that. Cause, cause it's it's sci-fi, right? You can't have a pit unless we call it the money black hole. That would be a good one. The money neutron star. That'd be really science fiction. I'm doing hard sci-fi because I called it a black hole. That makes me more sci-fi than than laser swords. It, it's all fantasy, guys. Don't forget that the money crater. I like that. That is clever. All right, retcon. Maybe that's why he's in port because he's getting the new name put on it. We didn't decide yet. You said Crater last time because it was sci-fi. Yeah, good. no, that's good to know. Do I have to change it anywhere else? I already changed it on my spoiler alert. I, I'm anticipating that we're going to run out of... We're going to push out our... Our... Um, calendar to the point that we need to fill in. So, I, I already made up. I sat down and I filled out. Check it out. Money Crater. Type M. Built by Black Reef. It is a Type M subsidized freighter hauling mail around the southwest cor southeast corner of the map. Jump three, one G of acceleration. It is a six Type M 600 ton. Doesn't have a shuttle. Okay, that's a, that's a thing. Where does it say? Um, I did some stuff. It doesn't. Where? What? How come it doesn't say? Muddy crater. Type. 600. It's a 600 ton hauler. Mid-sized. It's got a crew of nine. I don't understand. When you go to... We'll, we'll come back to this. Don't worry. I don't understand. When, when I when I looked at this... So here's our, here's our Starships. And I just used... I basically used the... The bulk... What, what do you call it? The standard ship design for a Type M subsidized merchant, right? 600 to hull. It has 30 staterooms, nine for the crew. And okay, good. So I wrote down the crew. And this could take a while. I mean, this is a great way to fill up some space. Because as you can see, I wrote down who all what all the positions are. You have a pilot, a navigator, a medic, a chief engineer, and two junior engineers, a chief steward, and two assistants. So this is our our steward's assistant, and I guess our assistant to the steward. One of these would have been old Chad, but, you know, he's, he's, he's a drunken idiot. He probably came to the door in his bathrobe and boxers. Oh, was, was that today? Hold, hold on. Let me take a, let me shave. And Captain Deuce is like, and a breath mint, go ahead, brush your teeth, take your time. So this is what I don't understand. Uh, you've got nine for the crew, pilot, navigator, medic, three engineers, three stewards. That's nine guys. 21 for the high and middle passengers. Wait a minute, but which one of these is the captain? I think it would be cool to follow the money creator with Captain Munderduce. And it does, if it doesn't, let's see, I'm looking at my my chat here. Jeremy Herndon would like to follow uh, Captain Munderduce. If Chad doesn't make it on the bird, gives us another story thread. Yeah, uh, you said crater. Let's see, what was the tonnage of the crater? So there you go. I, I, I went ahead and designed this. Now, this gets complicated because I'm going to have to generate nine crew members. Well, oh. I'm going to need to generate a profile for Captain Munderduce, right? And I need to figure out what job he takes. Or I'm losing a, another berth. And that's what I did here. I said, oh, it's got 30 staterooms. Because in addition to each of these guys that are getting paid, you got Captain Munderduce there. And we did say that the chief engineer was Dan Thurshadu. So if we do this... That's kind of what we're looking at. Now, and, and I, I glossed over this on the Lil Stinker... Because there's just not a lot there. But for a a bulk... Money, oh, i got to change it again. Look at all these places. i got to... This is why I don't like to revise things. The Money Crater. So on the Money Crater, it's got a Model 3 computer. And I picked... Okay, so a Model 3 has five installed programs. And it's got nine total. So four... Wait. Did, did I do that wrong too? Does it have nine in storage and five in the dock? Does that? I think I might have done the other one wrong too. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! This gets this gets even better. Oh, long story, but I still haven't answered the question. 
I think I need to generate Munderduce's personal profile to figure out what his skills are so that I can plug him in to one of these positions. Maybe he's maybe he's the chief steward. Although I'm hoping to name my chief steward uh, John Jeffrosen because the chief steward makes sure to organize lots of swing dancing on the ship on those week-long uh, voyages to keep everybody happy and occupied and, and socializing. So if I generate a a suitable like merchant marine captain, that sounds right. Five in the dock and nine others. Yeah, I've I've completely under guessed how many programs we have. Syra confirms the skipper is typically the pilot or navigator on these smaller vessels. Oh, okay. So if that's the case, if he's the pilot, you're saving six grand a month. The number that I put in the parentheses is our monthly cost. It's 35 kilocredits a month to pay all these people. So if I decide he's the navigator, then this goes down to 20, 20, 30 kilocredits per month, right? Uh, and then I did write down, you know, I just kind of made notes on you, every jump costs 90 kilocredits because you have to burn 180 tons of fuel. That's burning refined fuel. You can cut that down to, let's see, what's uh, 180 kilocredits if you're using unrefined, or 18 kilocredits if you're using unrefined fuel, which you got to if you're in Corvinus because they have a class C starport. Before we get to this thread, I mean, there's a lot of work involved with figuring this out. Do we generate all of these right out of the gate? Do we wait until we need these and then generate them? In fact, I'm going to do that right now. The, the chief steward is going to be John Jefferson. Because I just love that idea is too funny. And, and that's that's a complimentary thing, right? Like, bear in mind, even as we kind of tease uh, Dundermoose with, with our making him. I, let's be honest here. I'm teasing Dundermoose. By putting him into Captain or Commander Adama's uniform. Like, how insulting is that? Oh no, you think that I would be an effective commander of the Battlestar Galactica? How dare you, sir? I mean, these are the kind of like teasing that you want. And and by the way, if I ever do, and I should point out, if I ever plug you in and you don't like it, then just say the word and I'll just change the name. I, I don't want to bother anybody. You know what I mean? Um, it occurs to me that a player who wanted to make bank would concentrate on expanding fuel refined capacity across campaign space. He could be the space oil baron. You a lion, Bradford Walker. You could charge a premium, particularly in this subsector, man. We got so... I think we only have one system with refined fuel. Like, we have three, but two of those, I just said, these are both A. We've only rolled one out of the, like, ten... Which, again, the, the streakiness of the odds, the streakiness of the dice really complements things. Let's get back to Chad. So we'll, we, maybe if we run out of time, that's what we'll do. And I have some ideas for ways to speed up the process of building an effective crew. I, I don't. You can't really just roll up. I'm going to roll up the assistant steward. Because then what if he doesn't get the steward skill? You, he needs to have at least the one. And if you can roll up a character with steward two, well, that's your chief steward. And his assistants will have steward one, right? Likewise with engineering. I'm not hiring a guy to be my engineer, particularly my chief engineer, unless he's got at least a plus one on his engineering skill. That just wouldn't make any sense. If you're not streamlined at 600 tons, you can't enter atmosphere. Is that intentional on this vessel, especially if you don't have a small craft internally? Syric, so the deal is the 600 ton bulk freighter is not capable of landing on a planet. Ours, well, ours, it's not ours yet. If we plug the money crater in, it does have, it does not have a shuttle, which means we are bound to the local shuttles to offload our, our cargo. And that does cost 10 credits per ton. So it eats into your profits because you have to pay to get it down to the surface of the planet. I can't find anywhere that it says you have to pay to get it loaded onto your ship. I believe that you take delivery in orbit. It's the, it's the seller's responsibility to get it onto your ship. But once you get to the system where you're going to sell it, you got to pay the 10 per ton to get it down. Uh, right. So the thing to look at here is I, I think I missed this. If it's five in the box, if it's nine plus nine, I only ordered... Maneuver, jump three, and I believe jump three is up through jump three. I think this program will allow you to do jump one and two. So that's one 
two, three, four. Oh, wait a minute. That's the space. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, which means that implies I still have five more that I can select. So if this is the case, the implied infrastructure for trade, Bradford says, is that there are a lot of local shuttles or ground to orbit elevator or both to handle big bulk trade flows. Yeah. And, and that's what the, one of the things that is glossed over a little bit here in Proto Traveler is that it's really vague as to whether the starport is in orbit or on the ground. And you really need to declare, declare that. But even if it's not an orbital starport, the starport that's, that's land-based will be able to have sufficient shuttle capacity to load and unload your ship for you. Supplement number four, Citizens of the Imperium has some pre-rolled NPCs listed in it. That's uh, from 1979. Yeah, it does. It does. I have some other ideas that, that we could use. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Right. The, the other thing I should point out is that I did buy, it has three hard points. I bought a sand lock caster and a turret with a pulse laser that bumps the total price of the ship up to 222 mega credits, meaning every year you're going to have to pay 222 kilo credits and take two weeks off. And again, that will happen on March 1st of 2025. Uh, um, I, again, I'm, I just picked an arbitrary date earlier. Uh, the other thing we could do is we could actually roll a D3. Is it January, February, or March? And with a 2, it's going to be February. So on this is the last time it was serviced. And I guess that makes sense because he got it serviced somewhere. Let's turn our attention to the map now because this gets interesting. He got it serviced somewhere in here, and then he made a jump, and then another jump. Now, he's got jump three. That means that we need to figure out what's in these five hexes if we're going to go that route. I'm not prepared to do that just yet. We have to figure out where the systems are and what the, at least what the star ports are, so we know where that refined fuel is. I'm not comfortable. That first jump for Captain Munderdeuce is going to be using unrefined fuel. See the C? And this ship, it takes 180 tons of fuel to make a jump. He can only carry 190. So we're back to that situation where you better jump to a source of refined fuel or else those penalties start stacking up. As a subsidized freighter, he's got to make that jump. And we can talk more about that later. But that's the other thing. When I say this, adding this additional thread is going to take some additional setup time. That's because, and when we get out here, check it out. Now we got jump three, one, two, three. That's all, that's the whole rest of the map that's reachable by Captain Munderdeuce. So there's a whole lot of system generation that has to go into this. I don't want to do that right now. I've been talking for 30 minutes and I still don't know what happened. Oh, the, the, the double six means that Joan Alice comes back to uh, Chad Solo and says, I understand you're looking for work, Mr. Solo. I understand that you have refused employment on the money crater. And Chad says, well, not really. And she says, I don't know what you would call it when you know you have a job interview. And he might protest. Well, I didn't know it was going to be Monday morning. She says, look, the ship's leaving in four days. And he says, hey, here's the other thought I had. He says, hey, um, Joan, uh, you realize that it's not like, are you telling me that I'm the first guy that ever worked on a ship that used his off time the weekend to get totally blitzed? Are you telling me Munderdeuce runs such a tight ship that he's not used to dealing with a guy showing up to work hungover? I'm the first one? Seriously? And she has to admit that's a pretty good don't you think, like, come on, he, he, I'm a sailor. You, you, you're going you're gonna to ding me for, for drinking in port? What's next? You're going you to ding me for, for visiting, you know, ladies of the night? Some space freighters should have the ability to refine their fuel. Unless that was a latter edition, uh, Jeremy Herndon is not at home. I, I got to find that, Jeremy. There are ships that can refine their own fuel. And I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't really gone through this in uh, with, with a fine-toothed comb. I need to fire up my PDF and do a couple of searches because that in Proto Traveler, they do mention that some ships can refine their own fuel. 
uh, costs and payments, uh, bam, required ship components, the hull, let's see, engineering section, get a power plant, maneuver drive, jump drive. I just can't find it anywhere around here. Optional components, that's where I would expect it to be. Uh, atmospheric streamlining is an option and may be added or deleted. Ships, vehicles, turrets, weaponry, sandcasters, crews. It's not even listed in the optional systems. If you look at the standard, let's see, expendables, missiles, fuel, repair parts. All starships consume fuel. I'm looking at page 17 here of book number two. Uh, at the end of 30 days, that's something else. Subsidized merchant. The fuel tankage will contain 190 tons. The fuel hull is not streamlined. The base price is 219,870,000 credits. What, let's see what else. No low berths on a cruiser. 80 tons of cargo space. Computer model. Eight hard points. The fuel tankage is 280, including 48 tons available for refueling pinnaces. Pin pinnaces. Uh, the Starship Design Checklist. Let's see, ship's vehicle, optional streamlining, costs one credit per hundred tons of hull. Uh, that's in millions. Naval Architects, construction time, starship combat. Is it in the combat section? That would, that would make perfect sense. The refueling is in the combat section. Why not? Got to put it somewhere, right? Now, then we're into drugs, and then we're into... Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. My, uh, my, my binder, my comb binder is coming uncombed. My, my books are starting to look like they got a mullet. Do, 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 which is a kind of fish and also a hairstyle. Maybe we should give Hank Hillsong a mullet. That would be in keeping with him. I would correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Hank Hill have a mullet when he uh, scored four touchdowns against... Oh, I'm thinking of the wrong guy. Uh, anyway, let's. Uh, what I was doing is I was coming back over here because I want to find that random plots. I showed you this last time. Random cyberpunk plots. Joan Allen. Joan Allen says, "Yeah, you know what? You make a good point. Should anything in this be called the Schadenfreude? It's amusing to see your pain as you search. Yeah, it's it. That's." We call that book control, when you know exactly where everything is located. Uh, but it, it comes with time. It comes with experience. Is it Clasm's Cyberpunk Mission Generator? I wonder if this is it. Uh, jobs come in. An aged, enhanced cyborg offers you a favor to travel to a public meeting. Yeah, we don't have really cyborgs on this planet, do we? Uh, I'm sure as heck not clinking, uh, clicking on these orange icon ones over here. Oh, I got a random adventure generator. Yeah, thanks, Reddit. Uh, crawl back under your rock. Ten ideas for a story. Chartopia. Mm. Man, I wish I could remember where it is. I can find it on my Twitter feed. I could also uh, switch the camera around so you can look at me, rub my chin, and, and wave my hands around like a... If you can wave my hands around like a lunatic in uh, on, on videos, you should see me. <laughs> thing about a pursuit of mastery is it's not work to the true enthusiast. Oh, Gary Gygax. Gary, you, you, you were taken from us too soon. I should be looking at my own feed here, because uh, that's where you find all the best stuff on the artist formerly known as Twitter. Articles. No media. The, the, the one I'm looking for, there it is. There it is. What's going down? I got to roll percentile dice in Traveler? What madness is this? Should I just roll the D66? That would be fun, wouldn't it? You could use a percentile. Let's zoom in on that really good. Low-tech solutions to high-tech problems. I mean, look at, look at this. Oh, that's a little too far. Whoa, look. Oh, we're in the wrong thread for this, aren't we? Um, we could use D6s. That means that you wouldn't have, like, down here at the bottom, right? You, you 66 is as high as you can go. So no new hardware. Uh, you wouldn't have a serial killer that you're chasing. Uh, and then a lot of things like, uh, you, you 16 PCs past catches up with them? Uh, we, you'd only have a 1 in 36 chance of getting that instead of the 4 in 
hundred. So well, that's about the same though, isn't it? Three percent versus oh, this is five percent. Media circus comes to town. Corporate going bust. There's some good stuff in here, man. New drug hits the streets. You only get that on a thirty-six because you can't roll a thirty-nine on uh, a D sixty-six roll. Let's do that. That's fun. That's different. That's wild and wacky, and that's the kind of thing we do here. So I'm gonna roll. Oh, all right, we'll go over here and, and we'll make that roll. And I get a forty-three. The black is always the tens. The black and tens. And a 43 means there's a gang. Well, we already kind of had a gang war, didn't we? So a gang war is about to erupt. All right. Gang war. Gang war in the background. So what does Joan Alice want Chad to do with this gang war? And I think maybe we already experienced a little bit of that gang war. I think the forces of the the fans of the sports and the religious nuts, may, maybe what we blundered into was not just a one-off. Maybe that was like part of an ongoing conflict that is costing everyone a lot of money. And Black Reef has said, we got to put the kibosh on this. This is bad for the bottom line. Should anything in this be called the Schadenfreude? Yeah, we saw that. Okay, high fuel purification comes in later. It's in High Guard, says Cyric. I could swear it's in my 81 printing, but I can't find it. Yeah, Jeremy Herndon confirms. Uh, high Guard is 79, so it's in the 81 LBBs. Yeah, the gang war he helped start. So we laid low for a day or two, and then she comes around and goes, Hey, you know, Sunday morning and yesterday, uh, there's been a lot of extra violence, a lot of blood in the streets, and we need to find someone who's not involved who doesn't really have a bird, you know, a, a dog in the fight to come like moderate and, you know, work out the differences between the church of Dagon and the Wayland tsunamis. And he says, well, okay, that's probably, you probably came to the wrong guy. Cause I was there for that first fight. And, um, you got any other jobs for me? And she says, tell you what, if you can go, we're, they're going to have a big meeting Wednesday night. That's tomorrow night. Uh, at, I don't know, whatever, like the town hall, right? And we're going to have leaders of the, the Crips and the Bloods, so to speak, are going to sit down and they're going to hash out the differences. We're going to work out. And I, I think what's going to wind up happening is that if Wayland Tsunami agrees to make a donation to the Church of Dagon, then we can put all of this ugliness behind. I need you to go and moderate it. He says, yeah, that's fine. I will do that, and then we can get him onto the Munderduce's ship. Or we'll at least give, you know, Munderduce is going to be there to see how he does. And if you are effective, then we'll give you another, we'll basically give you a do-over that Munderduce can, you know, he'll take you on on a trial basis. He'll take you on one jump, and if you work out, then maybe he'll keep you on permanently. But that first one is going to be unpaid. You're not going to start working for him officially until April, right? So I think that's probably a pretty good way to do it. Because uh, now we have... And, and ultimately, you know, th this is the kind of game that either you're not rolling a lot of dice and you're just doing a lot of talking, or you're rolling tons of dice and it kind of slips into that RPG ASMR where, like we did last time, we were like... We get two hits for, for X damage. We get two hits for X damage. We get no hits. We get two hits for X damage. And you just kind of repeat that, which is great. It'll help you sleep at night. And when I get into that, maybe I should soften my tone. And maybe I should move my head from one side of the camera to the other. So that as we talk about our two hit roll and we talk about our damage, for those of you that have your headphones on, it can be extremely disconcerting. And I'll stop now. Uh, man, Chad is going to blow the ice, <laughs> blow this. The war is going to go hot and force Munderduce to flee the world early and cause the money crater to get lost in space. Could be. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. So we have to roll. Now, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Wednesday night. The, the starship is leaving on Friday. Today's Tuesday. She comes by and says, work this out. All right? And he shows up, and it's really embarrassing because he has to face his other guys. If only the magic space baby was here to calm the chaos, says Paul Stanley. 
hey, Paul, do you want to be a crew member on the Money Crater? Uh, the the question is, what is our what's our check? Like this whole adventure is just well. First of all, let's find out. So you can we're gonna make a little mini game. Paul Stanley, Chief of Security. How about Gunner? I, there's a Gunner on that ship that is unassigned yet. Uh, if I can find the the roster here, there's a the little stinker. You, you think it's bad seeing me fumble through a rule book? Wait until you see me fumble through my notebook for the ship's roster. So there's Chad Solo. Where, where did it go? Oh, there it is. Okay. Let, let me pencil you in here. So this is all the positions that we got to fill. Navigator, medic, and we, we are going to have a gunner. Ah, by the way, I, I bought a gunner. That's why we have 10, because I added a gunner. This is not part of the standard crew, but because they are a subsidized ship and they are hauling the mail, you're required to have some defensive capabilities. So Paul, St Stan Paulney, we all know it's you. Stan Paulney is our gunner. How about that? So your your space security, and we'll see what other skills he has. Remember that we, when we generate this character, we, he's going to be required to have Gunner 1 at a minimum, and he's going to have other skills as well. In fact, I think I, I think I already generated Munderduce because I was so excited about this. Yeah, here's Munderduce. 954B87, 42-year-old, six terms in the Merchant Marines. He's got a retirement of 6000 a year. He's got Navigate 1, Pistol 1, Jack of All Trades 1. Bribery. Oh, Jack of All Trades and Bribery, huh? And then uh, we, Vac Suit. And what is what is we? Oh, he can pilot Wheeled vac Vessels 1. He's got an Auto Pistol and 45,000 credits to his name. So that's our... Oh, so he is. Munderduce is the Navigator. So Navigator and Captain is Munderduce. And I'll just write that down here. Munder... Deuce. And I spell it D-O-O-S-E. Rhymes with moose. But we're, we're here to, we're here, ladies and gentlemen of Innsmouth Station, we're here to try to work out the differences between the fans of the limpets and the men of the Church of Dagon. So why don't we go ahead and begin with an airing of the grievances, and then we can move on to the test of strength. And maybe we could play out, maybe we do like a pit fight to decide who wins, right? That could work. If this goes poorly, maybe that's what we do. And if one of the guys dies, that would be it. I gotta tell you that playing the game section, this is how, this is how minimal the rules of this game really are. Here's playing the game, page two, page three. Die roll conventions. Here we go. Saving throw. Dice roll to achieve a stated effect. If only a number is stated, it must be rolled exactly. Number followed by a plus indicates the number must be rolled by a minus indicates that or less. Uh, we're going to call the Finding Common Ground a... All right, I got I to gotta think about this. And I should probably write this down. So we're going we're gonna to make this a social check, Okay. And there's going to be, this will be one of those things that to make the mini game, you, you either have a single roll or we're going to have a, a, a couple of if-then loops that we have to work through. And higher means that he has found common ground. So on a 12, he's the hero of the day. That, that he finds a way for them to bury the hatchet. And on a 2, a riot breaks out. And it begins to spread throughout, throughout. okay? Uh, now, remember, it won't just be the Wayland Tsunami guys and the church guys there. Everybody is going to be there because they want to know what happens. And the other thing that, that is interesting here, remember that it was the church guys that started this fight. They started jawing at the hooligans, and the hooligans turned around and came back. So depending on, like, in, in the U.S., if you're walking by and the guy's jawing at you and you turn around and you approach the fight, you are just as guilty as the guy that was jawing at you. You could have left. You didn't have to fight. You had the choice. You chose violence. So that's another thing that we have to think about. I think anything up through, let's call it now as normal, an eight up means that an agreement is reached. Agreement reached. 
All right. And uh, you can also take a look at the reaction. So basically what we're doing is a reaction check. If we get the riot breaks out, right? So I'm just kind of mimicking what I see here. If I get violent, immediate attack. If I get hostile, then that attacks on five becomes no one's happy, that nothing is resolved, and everyone goes home angry, and the, the Cold War stays cold. Uh, if we get a six, seven, or eight, I actually have to make this a nine or better. On a six through eight, it's a temporary piece at best. Everyone professes peace, but everyone knows that they don't really mean it. This is a, a Von Ribbentrop pact, which is just good enough to earn our boy a second roll. But that roll is going to be, he gets a, a neutral roll. And what does this mean for our guy? Well, if we get a six, a five or six, he's, oh, okay, I got it. Got it, got it, got it. We're actually going to make this a roll at minus one. If he gets a nine or better, then he gets a neutral roll. And if we get a, we'll call it a nine or a 10 is neutral. If he gets a result of 11, oh, that's 11, then he's going to get a plus one. We got a, a piece through dollars. He negotiates a, a settlement, the paid settlement. In fact, that'll be for 10 as well. Piece through $1.00. The hooligans agree to make a small donation. This is a big donation, and peace is finally achieved with the result of a twelve or better, right? And then down here, we're like, you don't even get, you don't even get. You're gonna have to like run through the streets, and we're gonna have to find another job next week. So that's the result of our role. And of course, if a riot breaks out on this too, we can actually do like a single combat between the two guys to find out who wins that riot, and maybe even Chad jumps into it. So here it is, guys. Here's our role. Ah. Take a look at Chad's character sheet. His social skills are nine, which means he gets a plus one on this check. All right? He's a friendly guy. And he says, oh, he, he says, hey, uh, Church of Dagon members, tell me, tell me, I'm listening. Tell me about your aggravations. Tell me, what, what are you feeling right now? And how does that make you feel? And how do you feel about how you feel? And then he turns to the soccer hooligans and he goes, Oi, mate, what's your effing problem? Because, you know, he knows how to talk to people. And that's how he's able to translate between the Church of the Bloody Fist and the Church of the, the Wet Savior. So we roll 2d6, and we add 1. And we get a result of a 2 and a 4, and that's a 5. And the talks completely break down. And, and the meeting goes on long into the night. And nothing is happening, and it gets to be late, and I should have wrote down here. So he gets a second chance at this, but this time it's at minus one. So after like two hours, the meeting starts at nine, and at like 10 o'clock at night, everybody's still screaming at each other. Everybody's mad. And, and of course, the Black Reef agents are there going, pick Barabbas, pick Barabbas. So 10 o'clock rolls around, and we make another roll to see how bad it is, but we're at minus one. And we get a nine, and, and he says, look, it's all good, baby. We, we can reach an agreement. I don't know, what would this be? Oh, this would be the, you know what, it, it, it occurs to me that if he's really good, it's a small donation. And with a nine, he, the Waylon Yutani finally breaks down and says, all right, we're going to pay for all the medical expenses of the guys that we injured, plus we're going to make a 50,000 credit donation to the church, and the church guys are not really happy about it. The, the elders are, but the guys in the pews, they're mad because that's pretty much how churches always work. Well, at least these days, right? That the guys in the pews are mad about being told what to do. And they, they think that the guys at the, in the pulpit should be a lot more um, vociferous. But, you know, the guys in the pulpits got there because they're politicians. And so they kind of water things down, which normally would be actually... They don't water things down. In, in a church of Dagon, you'd want things watered down as much as possible. But but the, the elders of the church of Dagon, old Hank Hillsong, he's a politician, so he keeps drying things off, if you know what I mean. This does earn us a possibility 
of getting all, getting another reaction from Munderdeuce. But it also means because of all that extra money that they had to pass, we are at a minus two on any reaction checks from guys from hooligans in the future. And anybody from Wayland Utani is not going to be happy with this. That did not go well. I will say this. I think that Joan Alice is happy because not only is there peace in the streets, the violence dies down. There's no more Chaz situation. Although it would be the like autonomous republic of the, the limpets. So it would be a Chal situation. Oh, a little shout out to uh, Little Wars TV. So Chal gets shut down and, and the, the streets and hallways of Innsmouth Station get cleaned up. And our guy has on Thursday a second opportunity. But to get to that opportunity, he's going to report to the ship and he has one chance of a random encounter. Which does not happen. So he gets to the ship. And old Munderdew says, all right, Mr. Solo... I saw you doing the thing, and that was not easy, but you pulled it off. So I'm going to give you one more chance. And old Chad Solo smiles his biggest smile, puts his hand out to one side and says, Come on, baby, give me another chance. And this is going to be just a straight reaction roll. 2 to 12, down the line. We get a 7, and he's noncommittal. He's like, yeah, I don't know. Come see me tomorrow. So the next day rolls around. And we have no random encounters. And we're taking off tonight. And we have one more chance on the reaction check. And this time we get an 8, which is he's interested. All right, you know what? I'm going to take you on as a trial basis. So Chad is going to jet off with old Munderdeuce on Thursday of this week. And that's great because it gives us like four days to figure out where they're going. And I may even, if he's amenable, I'll hit up Dundermoose. And if we generate a couple of systems here then I can ask him, hey, where do you want to take your ship? Which of these is the route you want to take? And, and here's the real secret. I, we, we put uh, Dundermoose in the campaign as Captain Munderdeuce as a funny joke and a way to kind of you know, joke around with him and include our friends in what we're doing. But this is how you backdoor create a faction. This is how you sneakily trick your friends into playing in your role-playing game. Hey, I named a guy after you. Ha, ha, isn't that funny? And then a week later, hey, you're that guy I named after you. Do you think he should attack the orcs or the elves? Well, I don't know what's going on. You don't got it. Just tell me, orcs or elves, who would you attack? Uh, I guess the elves. Then when you sit down at the table and your players are like, why is he attacking the elves? You can say, hey, bro, bro, I didn't decide that that patron was attacking the elves. My friend told me he picked. So blame it on, uh, my hands are clean here, buddy. I have nothing to do with this. Somebody else made it happen. And then when you murder all of their people in the elven forest, it's not your fault. Right? See, these are the tricks. These are the tricks, people. You won't find this on the critical rolls, will yous? You won't find this on the Matt Colvilles. But we got time. Let me check the chat. What do you guys think? Was that a fun little mini adventure? A fun little mini game, right? It's a Festivus miracle. Uh, yeah, maybe the five, maybe that would have been good. Uh, let's see, the Church of the Soggy Savior. The Church of the Soggy Savior. Yeah, they sell salvation and salvation accessories, Lost Chaplain. Oh, you'd make, yeah, Lost Chaplain. You'd make a good, uh, you'd make a good medic. Probably. Like, uh, like old Book. Like if Book and, um, and the boring character on... <laughs> the the, the good-looking doctor whose personality was um, good-looking on Firefly. Uh, where did I put my spaceship roster? Here we go. That's right here. Right in front of my face. If a snake, it would have bit me. Uh, Lost Chaplain, you want to be a medic? Uh, we're going to call him... Oh, let me think about that. We're going to call him... Lane... Los Chap. Los Chapa. There we go. Hey, a little bit of diversity in there. Lane Los Chapa. You know who that is. You know that's you, Lost Chaplain. Although, I, I don't know. I like to use things that I can, like, Photoshop really good. Let's see. Finally cut a live one. Plus one, but then minus one because he abandons the hooligans last time. No, the hooligans are still mad at him. In fact, they're even more mad at him because in order to get that settlement done... They, they had to pay a whole lot of money. I love when it, it gets them to play that way and it takes the decision-making away from you. Jeremy Herndon signs on. Lost Chaplain, my pockets are full of Band-Aids now. So weak. So the next thing to do is let's go ahead and, and figure this out. 
we're going to have on a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I got to roll five dice. One, two. We get a de nada, a de nada. Three more chances. One, yup. So there's a system here and a nope and one more. And a system. So we got two more systems of the downs. And we're going to need some names. I hope some more of you guys are talking. Luke, we already named something after you. Don't hog it. We have we don't have a we don't have a mic'd up. Oh, what was the yeah, let me check my notes here. There was somebody I feel bad because I took something away from I didn't read my notes carefully enough on the adventures of Chad Solo. Uh so Jeremy Herndon, th there we go. Herndon has got to be one of these. We're gonna call this system Herndon. And who else is in the chat? Do we call it the Stanley? Paul Stanley. Have we named anything after him? Random Hungarian words make good sci-fi names. Yeah, boy. They do. Hey, go check out Corvinus's new... He's doing a... He's doing a war game on snow hills. He's doing moguls. Which is a joke. Because it sounds like... Mo is it pronounced moguls or muggles? The muggles. It's the non-magic uh, empire. It's it's the mogul empire. You guys know what I'm talking about. G H U L. Uh, so th this is Herndon, the Herndon system, and then one more moguls. Is it the Mughal empire? Who else is in here that I haven't named anything after? Do we have a Cyric? I don't think I've named anything after Cyric. I got Shauner, Vegas, and Tobor. Yep, so this is the Cyric. And then the other question is, do we? Do you want to go ahead and generate some UPPs? Are you guys down with some UPP? I've only got two systems to build. That won't take all that long. I got, uh, I got to do Herndon and Cyric. Cy R Rick. I don't know why. I have a I have a easier time naming systems after my good buddies than I do people. It probably has something to do with the fact that that all of my the people that I name after my friends die horribly. And by just tweaking the name a little bit, I it feels a little more it feels a little less personal. You know what I mean? Like I don't mind killing the the guy named after my friends as much as I name Mind killing the guy who's totally named after my friend. The first thing we need to do is figure out these star ports. And uh, the Herndon is going to be in the black dice. And the and Cyric will be in the white dice. So Herndon, we finally... There you go. We finally have a six, a B class. Oh, good. So Cyric is B and Herndon is uh, with a 9. That is another D class star port. So Herndon, you got the big single D... And Cyric, I think we know where we're going next. We're going to have to jump to Cyric. Although, it probably depends. One of the things we'll wind up doing is figuring out where our star systems are linked together. And we may have to figure out what our um, loop is. I would imagine that a subsidized ship has to return to Corvinus if it's subsidized by Black Reef, you know, at least once every three months. So we may pick out a route and we may just have to pick out the, the places that have the highest population to actually justify the cost of running this ship. That being the case, we do have some world pairs that we have to figure out. We've got a D to E, which will only have a connection on a result of a 5 or a 6. So no connection there. A D to a C happens on a result of a 4 or better. So no connection there. And a D to a B, or a B to a D, happens... Well, wait a minute. This is a jump, too. Only on a 6. I'm glad I bought Navigate. So B to a C happens, because that's a jump, too, on a 4 or better. Nothing. All right. What about B to a C, a jump 3, on a 6 or better? No. Nobody likes anybody around here. Uh, am I missing any? B to E is not going to happen. D to D is not going to happen. And D to C uh, is not going to happen at that distance. So yeah, that's, that's it, guys. You're going to need a generate program because you're not buying any jump cassettes to get you anywhere in this region of space.
the other thing that we'll do, so that's that. So Herndon is going to be 2D6 minus 2, a size 9, 9,000 miles. And the other one is going to be 7,000 miles, so 9 and 7. And let me roll the black dot. Let me just write this down. This will be black and white. We're going to do them simultaneously. We're, we're double fisting it. The atmosphere is going to be minus 7 plus the size. So for the black one, we get a 7 minus 7 plus 9. The atmosphere is dense and tainted on Herndon. And this 8 minus 7... Well, I'm sorry. It's... No, no, no. no, 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 no. Okay. 7... Minus 7 plus the size. Yep, that's going to be a dense tainted atmosphere. Cyric is going to be 8 minus 7 plus 7, so that's going to be dense. That's an 8 for the atmosphere there. Our hydrographic percentage is going to be 2d6 minus 7 plus the atmosphere. So Herndon becomes 1 plus 9. That's all water. So that's... Did I do that right? If we oh no 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 because if you have a dense atmosphere dense tainted atmosphere it's an additional minus four so it's eight minus a total of eleven means we have three it's going to be a thirty percent water whereas Cyric with the ten minus seven plus eight is going to be eleven that's going to be all water? Did I get that right? Hydrographic. It's two dice. Minus seven is three. Plus the... Oh! Yeah, plus the atmosphere. Unless it's greater than nine. So this is a, another water world. Hey, how about that? So Cyric. And this is the big one. This is the real reason I wanted to go through this today. I need to know which of these are the high population worlds. In this case, you, it's a straight 2d6 minus 2. So the this becomes a 4, and this becomes a 2. So 4 and 2, we've got a thousand, thousands of people, tens of thousands on Herndon. And let me roll. So it's 50,000 people. And how many hundreds do we have? We have 400 on Cyric. So the, the good fuel has no people. All right. What about our government types? These are, oh, 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 oh. Okay, so I got a three and a three. So they're both restricted minorities. All right. Perpetuated by a restricted minority. I'll take it. It's, wait, government type. Is that right? Government type is planet is two dice subject to an automatic minus seven plus the population oh shoots all right so both of these are going to be minus three plus the population let, let me erase this minus three plus the population so this is going to be cyric has no law and this is planetaries government is minus four. So this three, be, I'm sorry, it's negative four plus four. This is a lawless world. Both of these are lawless worlds. The law level is going to be uh, minus seven plus zero. So 2d6 minus seven. We have a law level of one on Herndon and zero. So we have a lawless water world on Cyric. All 400 people don't care. And uh, technological matrix, and now we get to have some fun. Our tech level for Herndon, it has a class D starport. So that starts us out at zero. It has a size of nine, so that's zero. Atmosphere of nine, so that's zero. It's got a hydrography of zero, so that's zero. A population is zero, so that's zero, and a law value, a government of one, which means that its tech level is one. Did I do that right? That's hysterical. Uh, starport of D, yeah, that's nothing. It's huge, is nothing. Its atmosphere is nine, three, zero, wait, 
population is four. I think that's one for the population of four. Yeah, and then... Now, wait a minute. Government, yeah, I think it's one for the population. No, I think it's two. Tech level of two. All right, so Herndon has a tech level of two, which means cannons is the best you can do. Syrik down here is going to have a starport of B, so he starts out at four. Let's use a die to figure that out. So we start at four, and then the size means nothing. Tell my wife. The A means for the atmosphere is plus one, so we're up to five. Then our hydrosphere of two means nothing. Wait, no, the hydrosphere is A. What am I doing here? Starport, so size is seven. Atmosphere is eight, that's nothing. The hydrosphere of A means you're at plus two, so that actually puts us at six. The population level of two means nothing. And then zero and zero, so he's actually going to wind up at seven, which gives us body pistols and pulse lasers. So Syaric is a little bit more advanced, which you have to be because there's no land. I think that's it. So that does kind of shape our decision making. I don't think we give Dundermoose any choice. I think he's got to go to Syaric first if we want to jump over to Herndon, and that's going to be it's going to be expensive, man. Going to a population two world, you're only going to be able to ship. 25,000 credits, you're going to lose an enormous amount of money on that one. I hope you've got some mail to ship. Uh, here we go. Ba -ba -ba, da -da -da. Okay, the only thing you're going to be relying exclusively on high ports or tech levels with access to shuttles. Plus, you can't skim fuel off gas giants. Are those single, double, or triple turrets? Uh, on the, the standard Class C, I believe is it's got a triple turret. Well, oh, you're, good point. It's a single turret on that hard point. That was all I could afford. Pretty sure you can build the ship with the ability to refine fuel on board. Subsidized freighter would have the ability to refine their own fuel unless that was a later addition. Uh, ships that cannot land usually have a shuttle or two to transport cargo. 400-ton merchant has the launch. Yeah, we have a, an air car in ours, I believe. Let me double check here. Uh, ship's locker. I, th I thought the subsidized hauler had a, the standard, I'm just using the standard galactic template. The hull is not, let's see, ba -ba -ba, it's a cargo passy, 124, fuel linkage, three hard points, three tons reserved for fire control. The hull is not streamlined. No, it doesn't. The, the scout ship has an air raft in it. But if I want to put one of those on my boat, you know, that's going to take up a lot of space, isn't it? How much space does a does an air raft take up? Like four tons? I want to maximize my hauling ability, so I don't think that's a smart play at all. Um, doo -doo -doo. Paul is the gunner. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Random Hungarian words. Here we go. Yes. Mo moguls. There you go. So just, just like the skiing thing. Paul is the gunner. Let's see. Or muggle. I don't remember Cyrus. I thought we had one somewhere, but I could be wrong. Herndon will end up a crappy desert world if I know my luck. Well, you're close, Herndon. It's 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 uh it's a low tech level. Tech two, man. Swinging swords. It's dense, just like me. Jeremy Herndon, desert world. Would it have a government if there's no population? Well, it's the population is in the hundreds. The deacon runs Cyric. He is the former high priest of Dagon. Delusional did you roll one die for the modifiers? Oh, that's a great point. Thank you. I think, I, I think I've missed that a couple of times. Vic, i got to roll two extra dice because it's not two. It's going to be eight for Herndon. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, eight and 11. I always forget that. It's a D6. Let me make a note. So here, here's what I'm going to do just so that Vic doesn't get to call me out for being a noob anymore is right here on the where I look the most when I'm figuring this out. Laser fire. That's not what I'm looking for. I am looking for worlds of adventure. Star mapping. World creation. There is a special chart that you use to figure out tech level. Here it is. It's 1d6 plus 
four plus nothing, 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 and nothing. That government of one really hurt us. We could have gotten an extra bump. But I wrote down an 11, and it's not 11. It's B. So our 400 people, This maybe this is a pleasure world. It's got no government. It's got no laws. So maybe this is one of those planets that uh, is nothing but but beautiful beaches and and solitary beaches scattered across an archipelago. Maybe it turns out Syrah is flossed in paradise for the rich jet setters of Corvinus and whatever mystery planets we have in this area. We can make a jump three to here where we'll have 4d6. How much cargo is waiting for us? 16 tons. I will load 16 tons. And what do I get? 80,000 credits, which is only 110 short. I hope there's a lot of people looking to get there, or else this ship is going to be losing a lot of money. Let me show you the rules on this subsidized spacecraft, because this will be very important as we move forward. I won't go through it in great detail uh, every time, but I think it's worth looking at. When it comes time to create revenue, you roll a number of dice equal to the population number of the destination. All right, so when we're trying to get back to Corvinus, and it's probably better to flip the page here, it's got a population in the one, two, the, the sevens. So we would roll seven dice. That's going to give us a much bigger number. It's going to be a lot more profitable to go to Corvinus. Passengers. When we're going to a 4D world, we're going to go plus black, minus white. Uh, so nobody shows up. If these were reversed, if it was plus white, minus black, I would have four high passages. Hey, that's $40,000. 40,000 credits that we're going to generate. That's pretty good. Oh, it's the originating world, so there you go. It's actually going to be three dice minus two dice. I did that a little backwards. So, and I'm doing this just as an example. How many passengers showed up? Well, we had 12, and then we subtract two dice. So we subtract nine. So three high passengers showed up. That's fine. We got 27 more staterooms to fill. Oh, that's not going to happen. And then for the middle passengers, same thing. It's three dice. We get a 10, and we subtract two dice. Hey, so we got three middle pass. Well, five. Let's call it five. That's another 40,000. So we're up to 70,000 on the passengers. And then how many people showed up in low? Well, it's going to be three dice. So we got four, three, and 11. But wait, we're going to a four population world. Subtract one, one, and two. So it's actually going to be three, two, and nine. Yeah, that's it's going to be hard to make think, make ends meet on this ship. Subsidized merchants may receive mail delivery delivery contract, usually as an adjunct to established routes. Five tons committed to postal. The starship is paid 25,000 credits for each trip made, regardless of the mail tonnage carried. Right? So that means that if we subtract five from our total tonnage, we get this little bonus of 25, right? And then, of course, deliver private messages. Generally accompanied by a credit of 2 to 120, right? So throw a, a 9 or better. Is there a private message? No, there's not. And then they give it to a random person. And that's really about it. However, when it comes to payments, you have to go look over here in a whole different section of how to pay for your ship. Uh, do, 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 standard Starship Designs, Custom Design Ships. Uh, oh, maybe it is before that. When you have a subsidized vessel, you still have to keep track of all your operating expenses. And I think that at the end of the year, they'll figure out how good a job Captain Munderduce did. And if he's running in the black, he's going to get canned. They'll take a ship from him. So we're going to keep track of how much money we've lost over time. And he may be able to supplement that with his own... Remember, he gets 6,000 credits a year. And he's sitting on a $45,000 nest egg that he can use to supplement that income. 
So that may be the thing is he's like, I don't care how much money I'm losing. If I can get a million credits in my own personal bank account, I'm just going to retire. Uh, expendables, standard designs, the above, the, the, the custom design ships, and then we're going to start to that. Where's the, where's the whole subsidized ships? That's annoying. Feels like it should be right here. Purchase. Here we go. Subsidies. The government may subsidize larger commercial vessels built on 600 or larger. Hey, 600, that's us. To assure consistent deliver service to specific worlds, they are assigned a specific route, connecting them from 2 to 12 worlds. Okay, the route will be determined before a merchant is purchased, right, to tailor the design. Uh, he has to make 20% down payment. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to waive that. The government assumes payments upon delivery and takes 50% of the gross receipts of the ship. The character is responsible for expenses and, and the cost of operation. Wait a minute. So anytime we make money, cut it in half, and that goes to the government. And then we have to deal with expenses and cost of operations? Holy cats. I don't get that at all, man. There's no way. It's going to cost us... Flossing would give you full staterooms. Yeah, sounds like a planet where a lot of shady stuff could happen with no oversight. I'm just saying... So we figured out on our little example run there that we were going to be generating 30, 46, about $60,000. Well, it's unrefined fuel, right? So it only costs us 18000 But man, we're only making seventy grand on passengers. And because we're going to a, a four, a, a population four world, let's assume we're going to Shawner first. 16... Boy, I got 16 tons again. At, f at 5,000 per, that's another 80. So I set, that's 156K that we're, we're netting. But of that 156K, the government is going to take 78,000. So I've only got 78,000 to meet my expenses. Uh, the character is responsible for expenses and costs. Yeah, so you're, man, I don't, I think this is an even worse deal than a 400 ton. I got to do some more research. I think that free trader is probably better and it stinks. Yeah, Munderduce, no wonder Munderduce didn't want to hire a drunken engineer. Yeesh. Check the chat one last time. You guys see anything interesting? Traveler needs a better simulation of lucrative government contracting. Uh, yeah, yeah, Corvinus. This is, again, the whole point is, if it was easy, you wouldn't need to go on uh, hijinks. You wouldn't need to run any heists. You wouldn't have to go on any adventures because you could just use the economic system. The fact that we need to come up with an extra seventy-five to 80000 means we're going to have to start looking around for some uh, some smuggling contracts. So we'll take a look at that in our next episode. We'll put together a, a crew, uh, we'll put together a crew, and we will put together a. We'll figure out how much shipping we've got coming into the ship. Remember when we deliver that cargo? Subtract ten. So that sixteen tons, we actually lose another hundred and sixty credits just getting it down to the surface. I don't know which planet we're going to go to. Hmm. Much to think about. I got to do some more reading. I'm, I'm, the game is 40 years old, right? 45 years old now. I can't be the first person to notice this stuff, and I can't be the first person to propose some solutions. Although, given that we went about 40 years without people playing AD&D by the rules and all of the things that were discovered most recently by people actually playing the game, maybe... We are. It's not just me. You guys are teaching me. And, uh, you know, or if other people have discovered this and solved it, maybe they haven't thrown it in their blogs. And if they have thrown it in their blogs, maybe those broken AI search engines that only want to show you ads and, and weird, funky art, maybe they just don't show me. That could be a thing. That's the beauty. You know, one of the things people don't consider, everybody complains about this new internet, like searches are going to be useless in about three months because all of the garbage AI that's coming out, on the other hand, now I have an excuse to not look things up again. Remember in the 1990s where you didn't know something and you just went, I don't know, and you moved on with your life? That wasn't so bad. Maybe there's some advantages to this after all. I don't know. Till next time, guys. I'm praying for you.